Alice Russell. Hello. Hello. Is this on? Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing very good. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, our pleasure. I heard you um, went straight in last yeah. night. I've got the shakes. I haven't had much sleep. Yeah? Yeah. Um, Macarena? Yeah. A lot of fun? Yeah. Where have Didn't you just come in from? Um, Brighton yesterday. Yeah? So, yeah. And is Brighton where you call home? It is 15 years now. Uh, shall I get that close? Shall I do a bit of mic technique? Maybe you could learn something yeah, today. <laughs> yeah. How many years? 15 now. Wow. It's okay. just near the sea and relaxing. And for those <laughs> of us in the room that don't know our geography of where Brighton might be, can you explain where that is, it's please? Right, it's sort of the south. So London's there and it's the south coast of the UK. Oh, so you're on the sea? Yeah. And what makes Brighton special in a musical sense? Um, it's just, it's quite small, so the community is quite small, so, and you mm -hmm. can walk everywhere, so studios, you just have a little walk down the road, mm -hmm. and um, I think, because it's quite close-knit, that's how it's worked quite well for us, true thoughts. And, and have you always been in Brighton, or? I was a Suffolk girl. From Suffolk? Where's From Suffolk? Suffolk? Suffolk's on the little bum bump of England, on the east, sort of southeast. It's like that little round bit. So you're a country girl? Yeah. Okay. In the fields. Right, okay, well we'll get onto that in a second, but um, I think it might be worth just starting in the present for, I'm sure a lot of us in the room would have heard your music before. If some of us hasn't, then maybe we should listen to something current. You've got a new album about to come out, right? Yeah, I have indeed. What's this called? It's called Pot of Gold. <laughs> I'm Pot trying to help myself. Yeah, Pot of Gold. I've got to remember my pronunciation. Um, and I think, double check, track one, I think. Track one, yeah. Uh -huh. So that's where you're at right now? Yeah, at that point. <laughs> that song, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's go right back to um, when you first started getting into music and mm -hmm. deciding that you wanted to be a singer. I mean, you've got a very particular sound when you perform and when you record. Um, are you, I mean, are you influenced by church music, by gospel music or anything like that? I just, yeah, gospel music was like, yeah, one of my main, I just, as soon as I heard it, I was like, oh my God, yeah. little hasty country girl jumping up and down in her room to that sort of stuff, because I just, it just struck a chord in me. It's mm. like, it's just because it's so emotional and so expressive, mm. it just made sense. I love it. And the harmonies as well in gospel stuff. It's just is that where you kind of first got your sense of, of harmony and... Yeah, well, I originally sang in a very English church choir, which was completely different to the sort of church choir I'd yeah, have liked sure. to sing in. But um, it taught me, yeah, good harmony sort of things. And, and how long did you do that for? Uh, I was like a little girl till about nine, I think. And then I sort of was like, I don't need to do this anymore. I'm a bit old okay. now, I thought. <laughs> so what was the... I mean, who was the first um, vocalist that really, you know blew your mind that made you want to become a singer? I think it was Stevie and Aretha in tandem. Mm -hmm. um, Stevie just because of the melodies and his riffs and Aretha just because of the raw rawness of her. Um, and a lot of blue stuff, yeah. Mm. They were the guys. Is there anything that you want to play us as a, as a kind of... Uh I wanted to play a gospel track that I... Number five on that. Okay. That I used to jump up and down to. <laughs> It's um, Edwin Hawkins singers, and it's just just finding stuff basically. That you just when I heard this, I was just like, yeah, mm -hmm. it moved me. Okay. <laughs> Once you decided that you you know were really into that sound, how did you feed your appetite? I just kept eating and eating and eating. No. Right. Um, it was. Basically, that side of things just kept like getting the Aretha stuff. But also, because in Suffolk, all the boys were into their hip hop right. in the middle of the country. And from that came finding the samples from those tracks and then going into a whole load of other stuff, which is funk stuff and loads of other records from, mm. you know, that you've never heard of. So it sort of all branched off at the same time mm. and sort of getting into the hip hop, but then finding the tracks that were used for those and then mm. it just, just burned out. So what was your, wh what was the first initial singing experience um, in terms of doing something kind of semi-professional? Um, it was band stuff. We used to, there's quite a few bands where I grew up and I just got up with them 
And through that, I met the Kushti boys and did the first, that was my first sort of proper recording. And they yeah. just asked me to sing on their, rec their little mm. record. When was that? It was, I think it was about 18. So yeah. Yeah, quite a while ago. <laughs> so at that point when you're 18 and, and you're a singer, I was just interested to know, mm. you know, from a vocalist perspective, what, what's the point at which you, you know, really develop the self-confidence and self-belief to know that, you know, yes, I am good enough to do this? It takes a long time of sort of, yeah, it's weird. You sort of do the vomiting before you go on stage and then, why am I doing it? And then... Yeah, is that what happens? Is that <laughs> when I was really young, I used to just get really drunk and then be sick and then go on stage. Great technique, guys, really great. Um, but, um, and then you just, you're compelled. It feels like it's not you. I think that's how right. I get around it as well because, I don't know, it's weird, isn't it? Performance things and thinking well, I don't how know. much I mean, is you is and... Yeah. Yeah, it's it's quite, uh, you sort of just get out there and it feels like it, you just go into another place. And it doesn't feel like, you, I don't know, it is me, but it isn't. That's the only way I can describe it when you go and perform live on stage. You're just in that zone. Forget yourself. That's the best way to do it, I think. And don't be afraid of making an idiot of yourself. Just jump in. Because if you think about it too much. Yeah. It Did he used to do that a bit, overanalyze? Sometimes, yeah. yeah, but and it used to sort of cramp me being able to get writing ideas out because I'd be like, oh, that's just stupid. But actually, the more you just get it out and just try it, if it doesn't work, just chuck it away. Don't be petty about it and sort of <laughs> try and own it all. Do you know what I mean? And just sort of let it out, sketch it, and if it works, it works. If not, just don't be afraid of just chucking it away. Um, and what is your sketching process? Um, it's phone, singing a little ditty onto a phone or me and Al in the studio quite often just sing, both do singing parts over stuff and then just put it in. Sometimes just start with the harmony parts and then do the lead or it's always totally different every time I write a song and whoever I'm writing it with, it's, it's always a different process. Mm. And what are the things you usually draw on for, or is it just like? Everything. Yeah. I think you can't, you need to make sure you're open for everything. Mm. And then, yeah. And has the, has the voice, the human voice, always been your favourite instrument? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, because in a sense, you know, when you're a musician, you can sometimes hide behind mm. an instrument or a, yeah, or something. But there's no hiding when you're the vocalist, right? No, it's you, it's your little body, so it's quite personal. And so for people that, you know, might be watching online or the vocalists that we have in the room that, you know, what, what are your tips in terms of really finding your confidence and, and finding that, that zone that you're comfortable to perform in? Sounds cheesy, but yeah, just not being too precious and just going for it. Right. And um, singing out of all the instruments, you really have got to have some sort of self-belief deep in there because otherwise the sound wouldn't come out. <laughs> you'd mm. just be, um, yeah, you just, you've, you've just got to go for it. So what was the point that you thought, okay, this is something that I could actually do professionally? Or I mean, when you, when you first get called in to do, you know, guest vocals on whatever it was, like a, a you know, house 12 yeah. inches and stuff from, and you're just doing one day session work, do you actually think about getting paid at that point or? I didn't, I think I've only just grasped that right. after being doing this for like 15 years. And I did quite a lot of tracks that did do quite well and someone else made some nice Nice uh, little pots of gold for themselves, but um. So how did you how did you rectify that then? I didn't. I think just let it go. You know, you just sort of get on with the next thing. That's the other thing. You just there's always new stuff that you're on doing, so you just <laughs> let it go. Really, it's fine. <laughs> so how did you first uh, uh, hook up with the True Thoughts Collective? That was when I went to Brighton. I went because I still couldn't decide what I wanted to do. Yeah, and I love doing my art as well. So I there was a course doing art and music, so I was like, great. I don't this is 15 years ago, yeah. is it? Yeah. Yeah, wow. God, yeah. And so I went there, a little 18 year old, and uh, they knew the Kushti track, so they managed us. That was when there was only two people at True Thoughts. And uh, they had Quantic, he'd done his first album, and he was looking to do some stuff with vocalists, so they put us together, and yeah, that was that the next chapter. And tell us about Quantic, who is Quantic? He's a lovely man who uh, <laughs> does a studio-based, um, you know, computer-based uh, project. But he also does Quantic Orchestra, which is live, very much a live mm -hmm. outfit. 
Have you got anything from your work with him that we could play? That is a good point. Um, I must have. This is terribly disorganised. Um, there's, yeah, there's something yeah. in there. But it's not Quantics or Orchestra, that's just, um, that's fine. I think it's the last one, number 10. He produced this one for me. He's a DJ producer, yeah. Now located in Colombia, he's lucky oh. bastard. Yeah. Really? He's moved Get out. Get ready! Oh no, before this? <laughs> <laughs> the lovely Mr. Quantic. <laughs> so um, what's the difference between your work with, with Quantic and the Quantic Soul Orchestra? What, what are those two things? Um, the Quantic stuff, we used to just do it in his bedroom and the Quantic Soul Orchestra would be in a bigger studio with the band sort of recording that and also touring it was that was when I sort of cut my teeth a bit with the performance side of things because I only had to do three tracks on the live show and there's 11 of us and it was just great it wow. really sort of helped me just get past that sort of self thing and just do it and, yeah. and it really we did a lot of about five years touring and wow. it was wicked and it really just got me to the next level of being able to just let go with the performances so I thank Will for that. <laughs> so that kind of prepared you to go out solo as yeah. Alice Russell? Yeah, it gave me the sort of confidence and the next little step to just go, OK, I'm going to do my own thing. Right. It's time to do that. And you did um, quite a few cover versions as, as Quantic Soul Orchestra, yeah, right? Yeah, you're bringing that into, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We did Hold It Down, which was the four hero. Oh, yeah. Because that's such Oh, you could play that instead if you want. Which well. one do you want to play? Uh, I don't know where that one is. It's no. on there somewhere, but we've got the Seven Nation Army one, which was actually nostalgic. There Nostalgia are a few white episode. labels floating around of some unknown <laughs> cover versions of, yeah. um, of things, and, and you did one of the White Stripes, right? Mm. Shall I plug it in? And this is the Quantic Soul Orchestra, right? This is, no, this is actually um, oh, okay. 77. Oh, okay. Another producer, and he just phoned me up. And I'd never heard the, at that time, I hadn't heard any of the, the White Stripes stuff. And he just played me the track, and I was like, it was just lyrically so amazing. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, this is what we did. You might need to turn up the volume. What I wanted to touch on was, you know, this band's called Nostalgia 77, and obviously Quantic's known as a kind of funk and soul DJ, really. Mm. And, and so much, well, all of the music that you've played mm. and that I hear from you is very much of that, you know, 60s, late Look. 60s and early 70s kind of, you know, soul mm. and later a bit of funk sound as well. I mean, it's all very, very, very nostalgic. <laughs> yeah, you nostalgic know, do you ever, you know, get tempted to do something really futuristic? We are, yeah, we've just recorded an album at the beginning of September that we've been waiting to do for a while, which is a bit more, a bit more on the electro side, actually. Okay. Yeah, crazy little synths and stuff. I mean, you've definitely made your name for that sound yeah, uh, over yeah. the year. I mean, when I think about your name, that I do definitely associate it with that, and I think a lot of people do associate mm. it with that sound. And, you know, recently as well in the in the charts, obviously people have had a huge success with it. It's, there's a trend at the moment, whether mm. it be, you know, the brand new Solange Knowles record, Beyonce's sisters just released a record oh, that's very yeah. Motown. The new Rafael Sadiq album is a complete Motown tribute. Um, obviously, Amy Winehouse has smashed it on both mm. sides of the Atlantic with the Dap King. Yeah. And um, what do you think about, you know, obviously, Joss Stone has always put out records <laughs> that's kind of been 60s influenced. I mean, whatever you think of those people as vocalists, put that to a side for a second. And just, is there a part of you that thinks, well, I do that kind of sound too? Why is it suddenly trendy now? You know, can't I have a bite of that apple? <laughs> a bite of tasty, sweet apple of yeah. success. <laughs> Um, we were sort of mentioning this earlier, and um, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't get into it for the apple of, of fame and fortune. Yeah. I think most people here probably as well. You get into it for the love of it, and you just see where it goes. You don't. It's a weird sort of idea to get into something for fame and fortune. Do you know what I mean? So in a way, I don't really want a bite of that apple, but I wouldn't mind. You know, obviously the facilities to use their facilities. That would be great. A couple of those studios, nice. Yeah. So the bedroom, that'd be good. I so mean, in terms of just a, a touring level and a tour, mm. tour support level as well, because obviously you've done it and grafted on the underground um, <laughs> side of things. And obviously being based in Brighton is a slightly different power base than like a London or yeah, an LA yeah, yeah. or a New York or whatever. But, um, but I mean, do you not 
think, oh, I'd love to have that level of tour support and love to have that level of marketing support and that yeah. kind of thing that someone like an Amy Winehouse does these days. Yeah. The only thing, <laughs> it's sort of, I suppose money, basically, I hate, it's one part I find hard in my life is the money side of things, but it's oxygen and, and it feeds what you want to do mm. creatively. Um, so in that way, yes, it would be great to get to the next level so that you can, you know, you could just do so much more. You just think, fuck, mm. what I could do? Some people go into studios for like six months with all these facilities and think, fuck, we recorded an album in like a week because, mm. you know, we're skin and, you know, we just get everyone in the same room and do it how we can do it. Mm. Tape things up and whatever, you know. And in that way, yeah, it would be great to do, to mm. have the money side of it so that you could put it back into the music. Sure, but and I is that that is what you are doing right now, though, right? Yeah, I'm putting all my, I've sort of, yeah, we're doing it like a, set up a limited company, so all my publishing and everything's going back into the business, so I'm personally skint, but we're just putting it back into recording and, and uh, mm. touring and stuff. And so what is the new model now? I mean, if you're, if you're a vocalist, it's not like, oh, here's my demo, let me shop it to labels and see what happens anymore, is it? It's got to be more sophisticated than that in 2008. Yeah. Is it is it a management thing? Is it a production company deal? What how I mean, what's your way forward, especially in a country like the UK yeah. that hasn't got the most powerful recording industry? You know. No, no, it's just doing it all yourself. Like I've, I left True Thoughts. I've had a great time there with them, and it's yeah. been wicked. But it's always the idea of trying to have your own copyright. It seems weird to have, you know it's your baby to then someone else have it, but not have all the benefits. It's better just to own your stuff. And I think everyone's just starting to do it themselves, basically, and take control of it instead of going, right, here, give it to the record company, and they sort it all out and, you know, take it away in a way and take it on that direction. It's better to just keep keep it under your own roof, I think. And has that been difficult? Yeah. So yeah. I'm bad at organisation skills, but I'm getting better. Yeah, yeah, but it's good as well because, you know, we just basically have set up a company, so we own the album, and then we just licence it out to various com countries and territories. So So you've basically paid for it from start to finish yeah. and then it's from that point onwards that you offer it for sale. Yeah. So the, the label aren't done. paying for it to be mixed or mastered or anything like that. It's yeah, I had to for the first time in like since I was a teenager I had to borrow money off my parents to do the photo shoot for the album cover and stuff like that because we were just broke and but they w there was a deadline to deliver it to the to get it to the record company. So right. it was like fuck What's the advance? Yeah. <laughs> Can't have it until you've done it. So it was like a bit of a catch-22 situation, but worth it, worth the slog. So you're getting 100% back? <laughs> well, yeah, me and Al. <laughs> Excellent. So I think we should talk about some technical stuff as well, because, you know, it being... We've talked about the throwback sound. I mean, I know I, I read an article about the Dap Kings and the, the stuff mm. that they use. I know that you don't work with them, but, you know, that... They they're very true to the kind of recording to tape and mm, and, and using yeah all the valve stuff mm. and you know being very true to the era of the music that they're emulating mm. or you know paying tribute to. Yeah. Um, what about you? Is that is that the same for you? Mm, with some of the mics, yeah. Al's beginning to collect a few. Mr. T M Duke is um, gradually collecting a few more of the old school. Do you know a few a few? You know, we we're all nerds I'm in here, so feel Yeah, free that's to the go. thing. I did try and get him to come because I knew that that side of things would be a... Uh, mm. No. <laughs> okay. I just turn up and have a little sing-song and he does all the plugging in and stuff. So I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, luckily, we've got Russ here. <laughs> so um, we, we're going to do a... Glad you. <laughs> we were gonna you. You were going to do like a, a vocal recording workshop this week at some point, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, if we were to do that in the next day or so, would you be up for getting involved in that? I'd love to. I've got to go tomorrow morning, but I'm here tonight. <laughs> that would be amazing. I mean, if people have yeah. got any songs that are ready it's to like go <laughs> or ready to record, then you're up for getting in the studio a bit yeah, later. Yeah, it'd be yeah. great. Okay, so we're great. here for. Okay. Um, let's Not play drinking. some more music. <laughs> I want to hear some more music. Yeah, should we do a bit yeah, of Prince? Yeah, some, something different. Oh, you want to play something old school? All right, let's do that. Or new school? No, that's fine. New school, old school? That's fine. <laughs> You want to play, what, what tune am I playing off here? Dorothy Parker, I reckon. Oh, well, any excuse to listen to that on a Monday, it's fine. It's just, oh. Yeah, my dad didn't, didn't like the Lady Cab Driver track when I was a teenager in the car. That was the only track I wasn't allowed to listen to. Okay. Got embarrassed. <laughs> let's, let's check this out. Introduce this one for us. 
This is um, the Ballad of Dorothy Parker. And, I mean, Prince is another one. As soon as I heard him, I was just like, oh, mad in love with him. He's just, yeah, I love it. All the old stuff, controversy, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just fantastic. The purple one. The purple guy. The purple one. He's nuts, isn't he? So um, <laughs> you mentioned that you've got a demo and a finished version. I thought that'd be interesting to, to hear the songwriting process, certainly for me anyway. I'm not sure what, what the process is for you in terms of where an idea starts out, um, mm. whether it starts out with just the song melody itself or whether it's based on the music, you know. Do you write? Both ways, both yeah. ways. Sometimes people give me tracks just to groove and I'll write something on top. Sometimes we'll go in the studio with just a vocal idea and then build the music around it. Or sometimes if I'm with Al, we just brainstorm together and just jot stuff down as we go along right so it's always so different but the one thing we've been doing lately is writing the song just trying to do it back back to, back to basics guitar mm -hmm. voice and then trying it out with a band so tour it out live try it in a different way um, and often it, it, the way that we like I'm gonna play you one now and it started off like like I'm gonna play you and it's ended up completely different but I think we're gonna go back to that and do two versions of it anyway because Okay. If a song's a song, I say do it. Do it loads of different ways. The, the Remix yourself. <laughs> yeah. Hold, so hold your ears though, because this is really demo, demo style. This is like the first. And what kind ideas. of gear do you use to just lay down your we, ideas on? Al's just got his um, just the the old hello, sorry, um, the computer and just the mic in a little stu tiny little room, which we call the studio. Okay. And then we so just jot it down. Pretty basic then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just get a mic in the room so that you know and so this demo was done in there yes it's and you can hear it oh boy you can hear it all right cool <laughs> so what's it called it's called dreamer all right. and this is the the first go that's what can happen if you let it <laughs> and then but i still want to do when we play live we do the other version because it's just so much more fun to do live <laughs> harder well it's quite <laughs> interesting to see the the demo <coughs> to the finished <coughs> version and how different that can end up I've mm. just been looking while we've been listening to it. At the look at all these notes that Alice has made on the way I was on the, the plane here. listening to all my favourite tracks and things. And um, so I've got to people. say, there's some pretty <coughs> damn good tunes on here. Can you read out some of these? Is this basically your influences list? Well, yeah, it was. I was just saying to you earlier, it's like when you're doing stuff and touring and recording your own stuff, sometimes you just forget to just do what I used to do all the time, which is just listen to all my favourite mm. tracks. And I haven't done that for so long. I just haven't had mm. just been running around and. Doing this, it was like, well, bring stuff that, you know, you were influenced by. And I started going through stuff, and it's like, Jesus, there's just so much. And I haven't, it was so nice listening through to it all again. It was like the same excitement that you get when a song moves you. And that's, yeah, it was great. It was really nice for me. As a, as a vocalist, I mean, do you ever listen back <coughs> to <coughs> stuff that you did in your early recording days and just think, oh God, that sounds so much like me trying to be so-and-so yeah. or, yeah. I mean, you know, it's the same thing, I guess, for any instrumentalist or producer who's heavily influenced by, you know, a handful of people yeah, that it takes a while voice. to, you know, evolve <laughs> from having that direct influence to finding your own voice. Mm. Um, I'm sure that's especially the case with, with being a vocalist, right? Definitely, definitely, because, you know, you do do that because you obviously you go with what's before and the stuff that moves you the most. But it is, it does t seem to take a long time to discover what your own voice is. Mm. And with the l stuff we've been doing lately, I mean, on the next album, I haven't got it that with me, but it's almost like we're going punky with it as well. And I love so many different genres of music. It makes sense to just do all of those because we've also got a track on the album that's like a little Brazilian sort of gentle gentle sort of vocal and it's like why not why not be able to do all of them as well but find your own voice but then yeah, yeah. where do you draw that line between <coughs> you know sounding a bit affected mm. by you know the people or the things around you or the, what your immediate influences are and and you know listening to yourself and and thinking yeah this is really me that's a tough one you know mm. it really is because um yeah, I just it's just a thing, the more you do, the more you get closer to your true voice. Maybe I'll get there when I'm 60 or something. Mm. Um, I mean, this last album, it feels like, yeah, I think I've, I don't know, there's a couple of songs like Lights Went Out, it's really quite an expressive song, and I've just really, I think I'm getting there, but it's, it's hard to know. You just, mm. I'm a bit of an emotional, feely kind of person, so I just go with, go with the flow and, mm. yeah. 
Hard to name. Okay, come on then. What sense. are the tunes on here? Read this out. Oh, we got some, you know, we got some Nina. Nina Simone. Nina Simone. Isn't it a pity and all that? Keep a light in my window, which is another gospel track. And Roberta Flack, because I remember that album, First Take, when I first heard that, and the one track called I Told Jesus, and it's like the strings on it. Mm. I just, stuff like that blew my, my tiny little brain. Right. You'd hear it, and it'd just be like washes of just emotion and... Oh, it's just so beautiful. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was doing that. Beach Boys, in fact. I We used to... Um, Good one for vocal harmony. Yeah, I love it. It's like my favourite vegetable. And we used to sing on the way home because it was quite dark in Suffolk on the road. So we'd get a bit scared walking back from the pub. So we'd actually do <laughs> Beach Boy songs on the way home. <laughs> Little Deuce Coop and shit like that. Um, okay. Anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> There's um, Grace Jones, of course, Slave to the Rhythm, Private Life. Uh, just She's beautiful. We've heard quite a lot of Grace this last week. She's yeah, just... Robbie here last week. Yeah, those guys. Pretty amazing. I actually... Grace, yeah, yeah, Grace yeah. big influence for you, yeah? She is, just because she's... I just love her style, just as a person. She's just yeah. a whole, the whole deal. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like everything's an amazing performance. Not that she's, that she's naturally just like that, but I just, yeah. yeah for sure. She's Beautiful. <laughs> Eugene McDaniels, anyone mm -hmm. like a bit of Freedom Death Dance? Anyone heard of that? Curtis Mayfield, of course. Uh, God, London is the place for me. It's that album Will gave me that. That's the other good thing about having friends that are DJs because um, they give me loads of tracks mm -hmm. onto my little iPod that I've never heard of. Kate Bush, Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Paul Simon, actually, 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. I mean, God, I mean, it's just... Where do you end? Where do you begin? I still haven't heard half the tracks that I'm mm. sure I'm going to fall in love with as well, so I don't know. Mm. Nas, all the hip-hop stuff, I mean, mm. White Horse, laid back. There's just, where do you end? Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot. And so the future, the future model for you is basically taking it all in-house yourself mm -hmm. and kind of really finding your own, you know, being comfortable to do all different styles of music, basically. Yeah. Definitely. And different projects. I think another thing is, uh, even though I'm still underground, it's quite nice to just make up lots of different names and do loads of different... Do you think that sometimes up. when you do that, you kind of dilute the possibility of people really understanding just the one name, you know? Yeah. When you have lots of pseudonyms, people... Like, yeah. Unless you're a nerd and you kind of know that it's mm. all the same person, then it's you lose a bit of your momentum. I think that's where it maybe it's for selfish reasons, nice to have different names, because you can totally... Free, if you do get a name for yourself as doing a certain certain sound is to keep that sound, but also free yourself up to do lots of other things mm. under different names. It's almost like another freedom, isn't it? <laughs> Hiding under another name. How, how do you afford to, to tour as a band without the support of a, of a record label? Well, nice big debt. <laughs> yeah? Is it literally like max out the credit card and, and just, you know, borrow some money to do it? Well, the other thing we're doing, I don't know if anyone else is thinking of putting out that stuff, is um, because we've set it up as a company, we're getting people in to underwrite so they can invest in the company, which okay. is a really good way of doing it because, you know, if you haven't got that money coming in and you want to do these things and you haven't got a record company, mm. it's another way of people taking a share of what you do but mm. facilitating you to do that. So we're trying to do that as well. That's the other way of trying to sort out. Do you feel that you're only ever in the, you're only in the position to do that now because you've already had a little bit of momentum and, and support from an, someone else's label in the past? Or mm. do you reckon you could do that out of the gate to I start think, with? I think you do that to start with because it's the same as if you were going to be signed to a record label. It's just right. doing it yourself but with more freedom. And I don't see why if you've got a project that you believe in, someone else will believe in that regardless of, you know. And do you think we can apply that to everything from bands to, DJ to to kind of DJ producer style to vocalist to everything. Yeah. In which case... Them, they're going to get a treat back, you know, a nice cake or something at Christmas. <laughs> in, <laughs> <Return>. which, <laughs> in which case, can you, um, <coughs> you know, I've got no idea how to do that. Can you talk me through how I would start to think <coughs> about doing that and what is involved? Well, the way I started doing it was because um, I wanted... To manager because I'm not good at the money side of things and talking about that side of things. Yeah. So I got Gary on board. 20%? It's actually not, that's an old, that's what's changing in the industry at the moment is the okay. way people are being managed and it's more like you are both shareholders in the company. So he's 30%, I'm 70, but not until we get anything back. Right. Do you know what I mean? So that's of the 
profit if you make any. Other, other than that, we're just putting in the work. And when you say the company, every time you do a, a live show, does the money from that go into it as well? Yeah, and straight so, out to the boys. So pretty much anything that you do, whether it be promo, yeah. live shows, PAs, whatever, the money goes straight back into that pot. Yeah, all apart from my publishing at the moment. So everything else, uh, sales and yeah, is mm -hmm. all going into that. So what are the things we have to think about when we, when we start? Well, get someone you trust. <laughs> Someone you trust, all right? Um, to do that side of things. Because Which I've got side my of sister, things? The, the um, investment side of things. If you want to get people to invest, um, just be careful and make sure you know you sort out the figures with someone you really trust. If you don't, I mean, a lot of you probably just are good at that side of things yourself. I'm personally not. I'm awful. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I just think that's the way it's going now because everyone's releasing their own stuff. The internet. It's, it's facilitating people to keep hold of their copyright and their music and still be able to mm. make a living so you can keep doing what you want to do. Mm. And, um, yeah, I don't know, I'm not explaining it very well, am I? No. My hangover's not helping me. <laughs> guide me, guide me. So basically, you. okay, so we know that you're a good singer, right? We know that you've got great musicians around you. Mm -hmm. We know that you've found someone that you trust um, on a kind of friends, business and financial mm. level. Um, what what do I need to get started? Is it just a matter of some capital to get started to start? Yeah, if you haven't yeah. got any money yourself, you've got to go out and see if someone wants to invest in you. And the way we're doing it is we're getting five different people to maybe say they'll underwrite 20 grand each or something, say, pick a figure, and then, then you give them 1% of the company and you have to work it out. So that you give them 1%. You get 1% of the... There's like... Oh, I'm so bad at this. We need Gary here. Okay. Um, basically, there's like 30% that we're going to be giving away right. of the company. But that doesn't affect me and Al, because obviously Al's got shares in the company as well, Tim Duke, because we write co-write all the music. Right. Um, and basically, you just go to a bank or a company that want to lend you a nice lump of money, and then you just have to ask. You don't necessarily have to borrow that from one person. You can mm. get lots of different people to to underwrite. It's like when you get a house and you need your p you know, someone to say, if they can't pay the rent, we'll pay it for you. Sure. So they don't actually have to put up the money, they just have to say, look. And will. explain how all of that is separate to the publishing side. The publishing side could go into that pot, but we keep. I, I'm not published at the moment. Oh, right. I'm just published by myself. So that's so still say you hear one of your of songs on the rec on, on the radio or synced on TV on an advert or something. How would you get paid from that publishing money? PRS. Okay. I'm still doing it. And I was with Sony, but I left because it was a, yeah. Right. And I mean, in this day and age, is, is that still a good viable way to make some money as a musician to get a publishing deal? Or? I think publishing is where it's at a bit. Right. If, yeah, definitely. Because sales are, they're just not. They're not at the all-time high at the moment for anyone. Mm. Well, some people are still doing that, but because the downloads and stuff, it's all changing. So I think publishing is where your main bread and butter comes from, mm -hmm. if you're a writer. And how often do you get a cheque from them? You get it like March and uh, July. And if you mm. get a little bit of an overspill, you get a nice little surprise in October. Yeah. Which is nice. And so what kind of things have come as a result of that? What is it TV and radio sync or is yeah, it more than that? Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. If you're publishing yourself, you haven't got someone touting it. That's a good thing if you're with a bigger company. They yeah. could either put you with other writers or, you know, get you on an advert. I think mm. that's why maybe it's good to do publishing deals with, you know, maybe a company that that's what they do. They go out and tout your work and say, well, how about you get with this person and write with them? Or mm. So at the moment, I haven't got anyone doing that, but we seem to be doing it ourselves. Cool. Well, I'm sure, I mean, on that side of things, I don't know if people have got any questions. This might be a good time to open it up to the floor. I won't floor. be able to answer them, but... No, <laughs> <laughs> Cause that's all very valuable stuff to know from, mm. the, from, the, from the get-go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not being Hi. clear. Hello. <laughs> um, I was, um, by what you said about um, c companies, people investing in the mm. company, uh, what kind of people? What kind of, of uh, is it just is it just people? Who do you got to invest in your company? Basically, and I'm quite lucky because my sister is um, that's what she does for a living. She goes to she works for Somerset House in London and various art councils and goes and raises money for people. So she's got quite a few contacts, and it could either be someone that's just minted and just wants to help out and loves the stuff you do. 
it could be uh, someone that's in banking, you know, other people, one of them's like an investment banker and he just loves the album and is thinking about getting interested. And I'm like, hey, that's great. Yeah. Other people, it's, pers you know, it could just be, there's some other people that are just, they've just, just got private funds and they want to so, it, so it's just like going to private people, trying to interest them in the music and finding that one yeah. Because no, cause I'm yeah. asking because that's kind of what, what I'm trying to do myself some, somehow. But also a good idea as well, I think, is if you've got a website thing. I mean, why not? Also, another great idea would be just asking the fans. I mean, if you think about it, everyone get 50p or a pound. If you've got people or 10 pounds or something, that could facilitate a week in a studio. If enough people said, right, we'll pledge that much money. Or, do you know what I mean? There's so many different ways you could maybe try and do it if you're skint. <laughs> But yeah, it's good to find people that want to invest in the arts and they I'd do it if I had loads of money. <laughs> I'd pump it back in. So yeah, hold me to okay. that. Thanks. <laughs> Hope that explains it. Any more, any more, any more? No. Any more questions? Come on people, wake Everyone's up. Everyone's snoozy. <laughs> we should play some ACDC or Metallica yeah. or something, should we? Oh, Tom. <laughs> Mr. Oberheim, no, we need, we need the mic. The demo and there you the go final of dreaming on one on the album well what we're doing with that is we're doing that one on one album and then the other one is is fitting quite nicely with a whole bod other body of work that's more electro sounding so yeah we're going to release it because i prefer that one do you know what i mean but it ended up in a different way but yeah we're going to release both of them because it's totally different experience yeah uh sound wise yeah fabulous did you uh, now how much of this did you write all, all of it is me and my Ginger Prince friend, Alex, so we co-write. This whole oh. album has just been straight down the middle, 50-50, musically and, and lyrically and everything. So. Fantastic. He's a great guy. TM Duke, check him out. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I have a, actually two questions and one comment. I like, <laughs> I like it, the, the demo version better, too. I think it's heavier. Yeah. And... <laughs> I kind of forgot one of the que one of the questions, but you are you you're very influenced by gospel. I was wondering, are you like a religious person? I used to, I basically I was brought up religious. I'm not really into the one God thing anymore. I'm more into my meditation and you know. But as a child, yeah, I was brought up in a religious family. But no, it's more for the for me gospel music. It's more for the feeling and the, and the expression of emotion. Um, and that's why I was drawn to it. It just, yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's because of the adoration stuff, the yeah. God and love, and, and that gets emotional. It's human nature as well, just to want to believe that we don't know what the fuck we're doing here. We just potter around <laughs> doing whatever we do. And anything that's sort of, I don't know, anything to elevate yourself and believe that there's something more to our little, what we do <laughs> is sort yeah, of an sure. emotional thing. So that's why gospel music rocks. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to ask you, like, um, when did you decide to take the step to work like full time with music, um, and how did it all like start? Like, I know that you you were you started like collaborating with different people, but actually, like, when did you think to yourself, like, okay, I'm going to start to just just give, give it up it and, just and yeah, go for the go for the push. Um, yeah. It was a gradual thing because I used to do work with people with learning difficulties. I used to do care work. And the shift work was great because I could just do random shifts. So I weaned myself off that. And just, it was about, it was when Quantic Soul Orchestra took off and we toured a lot. So I suppose it was about six years ago. I just went, right, fuck it. I'm just going to be skint and I'm just going to do it. Because I think you have to. Otherwise, you're just spreading yourself out. And it's good just, you've got to give it the chance, haven't you? And got to see. And I keep jumping and see if something will happen. And I'm getting older, but you know, you've got to keep jumping in and seeing what will happen. And it's worth being skint for a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got more of a technical question here because uh, comparing the demo and the and the final version, mm. the uh, on the demo is just you singing once, yeah, just a single vocal track, and the, the BVs, yeah, and the on the on some of the songs you played, the vocal is really sharp and exact, but really spread out and fat at the same time. So it's like 
must be sung three times over, or how many voiceovers do you, you mean do the usually? backing, the backing, the harmony bits? Yeah, yeah, the actual yeah. lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just, I'd go until the cows come home. So Al tells me to stop. I think we, <laughs> and he's on that as well. We just get with those. It's we get all the boys involved. So I think there's about six, and there's Voice quite a lot of double ups. So we get the boys to just do in unison and live. We do that as well. So cool. Sounds really sharp. Huh? Yeah, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Sharp. <laughs> Who, Al? Yeah, does Al play the drums? No, he's, he's guitar man. We got Jack. That's a good drummer. Yeah, he's heavy. He's just, he's, he is, he's just a heavy, it's like that. Ah, and we can't afford a screen yet. I watch all these lovely like, singers on another level and they've got the, you know, the Perspex screen. I need one of those. Because he is like so loud sometimes. I'm like, Kelly, what's that? But he's wicked, yeah. I'm lucky, I've still got the same boys that I've been with for five years, so. The band's been very supportive. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> it's n it can't be personal. No, no it's not personal. Uh, like you, you, and this, for for example, like this demo track. Did you like produce it, or was it your your partners and? Al had come up with that, and um, basically the drum beat was done by the drummer, and it was just a drum beat. And that was all we had. And then Al just the and that's all we had. And then we wrote on top of that. So it was just, it, I think he'd done some crazy, I don't know, it was not just on the drum kit, the actual original drums. It was just sort of weird hitting all sorts of pots and pans and stuff. And then, yeah, so really we've got Jack to thank for that one. That started that one off. You got to, to produce anything? Like like you make a beat once in a while, like for fun or something like that? Yeah, well, I'm not very good at that side. I should have concentrated at college because I got the opportunity to learn it, but I don't know why. My brain just isn't wired in the... I get frustrated because I'm quite in... I have to do things quite immediately when I'm expressing myself. <laughs> so I, I found it too frustrating. I can do like a little four track I've got at home for just... But I need to just put ideas down as they come down, so... It just takes me too long to understand it all, so <laughs> I get Al to do that, and then I just sing. <laughs> so it's better for me. Yeah, but learn both, obviously, it's better. Hi. Hello. Uh, hello. Hi. When you go on tours, especially in funk music, uh, improvisation is uh, very important for the singer. Do you improvise a lot? And when you're jamming, I'm, I mean, when you work a new song, do you let yourself improvise? Or, or it's all have to be cut like you planned it before? It must be planned. No. Um, that's the thing with rehearsing the band, because the more you do the planned stuff, the more you can improvise, because if you get everyone tight, everyone feels more relaxed to know what they're doing, so we can then step out, and we're definitely developing that side of the live thing. But I think when you start off, everyone sticks to the songs and la la la, but the more you get to know them, the more you can play around with them live, which is more fun. Uh, but, but that's kind of the problem with uh, funk albums, and uh, it's not a problem with, with the gigs, with the shows, because uh, in, a, in a show you can go for 12, 14 minutes of a funk track. In an album it doesn't work, so how do, how do you try to make it uh, right in an album? Would you... Sorry. I, I mean, when, when you do a show, yeah. sometimes you can go with one song for 12, 14 minutes, uh, okay. and, and it doesn't work in yeah. an album. No, but I mean, I don't, I'm just trying to think. It's, what you mean, every track has to be different when you do it live, so yes. it's, and what, what else are you saying? I don't just know, I'm Basically, really when gorgeous. you play live, you can play for, for ages, but oh, on, right. a, on a record, it's, it's better when boring. it's four minutes. Yeah, keep it short. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Does that, I don't. Thank you. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> You're getting an insight into my brain. <laughs> Sorry. Any more questions? Jeff. How you doing? Hello, how you doing? I'm wanting to know if, um, as a singer, you notice any tangible difference between UK soul singers versus American soul singers? I get asked that a lot. Um, and uh, I think the only difference is maybe... I mean, I suppose, I'm trying to think examples. Winehouse has got that grittier with her lyrics. Maybe lyrically it's a bit more grittier and rough and ready. But then it's so hard to generalise because I, I, I find it so hard with questions like that because 
everyone's so different. And sometimes you'll think someone's from the UK and then you find out they're not or they've moved somewhere else. Or, do you know what I mean? So I... I mean... Yeah, does that answer what you're saying? I just think that's the only thing I can think of, that sometimes it's a bit grimy and rough and ready. Because there's quite a lot of over, maybe overproduced stuff um, as well, with the sound of some soul R&B stuff from the States. But then having said that, there's a lot of other underground stuff that isn't. So, yeah, a bit of everything everywhere, really. And um, being inspired by American soul music, have you like made like a pilgrimage to Memphis or Detroit, any places in the States to sort of do that whole thing? I'm planning it. I haven't been to Memphis yet, but I'm going to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? One over here. Yes, sir. Everyone's too scared to ask me questions because of my stupid answers now. We better not ask you anything. Um, I was wondering what precautions you have concerning your instrument. Uh, what, how to look, what, how I look after it or what? Yeah, if you worry about, uh, yeah. then what do you mostly do? Uh, if you a few years back, I partied too hard and I actually had to have a, a nodule removed. Um, it's a lot of thing that a lot of singers are scared of, and it's one of my biggest fears, and then it happened to me. Um, and that was through late night naughty treats and talking too loudly in clubs. <laughs> and I actually, he couldn't believe I was still singing on it, because it was like, he had a look in it. It looks like a pair of ladies, anyway. And um, there was a little nodule, and I had to have a little half operation, and then not speak for five days, which was quite interesting. But most of the time, it's just singers have to sleep, man, and, and drink water. And, but a lot of us like to go out and party too, so it's a bit, it depends. If you're doing like day on, day on touring, you've got to look after it if you want to perform. And I used to not, but now I do a bit more. Because otherwise you get a bit pissed off if you can't express yourself with your full, full range and stuff. So does that make sense? <laughs> now, you've had two. You're not allowed any more. <laughs> I just came just up with something. Um, when you write lyrics, uh, do you find that there's, um, like, um, we were talking about this uh, a couple of days ago, that uh, when writing uh, a song, it's important, the lyrics are important, the meaning of the words, but mm -hmm. also how they sound. Like, how, how, you know, the flow of the words, the, 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 the musicality of the words, if mm -hmm. that's even a word, yeah, I don't yeah. know. So what, what do you find more important? Uh, like, how does it sound or what does it mean? What does it mean always for me? But that's why me and Al work well together because he's... The way we work is like, I might come up with a sentence and he'll change one word in that and it will just make a lot more sense and sound better. So that's when working with other people, I think, is just like, it's gold. Because you can just question each other about what are you trying to say there and twist things around a bit? And he's much more like that about the sound of stuff, whereas I'm much more emotional and, and the feeling. So together, I think it's quite, it makes quite a good team. Do, and, and the genre of soul and gospel, it often really, like, there's a lot of, of things to reference to, and there's, like, these, like, a couple of topics that are, that are always uh, dealt with in, in these, in these uh, like, you know, love and faith mm. and... Uh, and empowerment and all that. Do you find yourself uh, uh, writing within these genres? Is that what you, or do you want, do you want to take it to another place? Keep it open, I'd say. Everything, you've got to, I think every genre of music has to be about everything because that's life and that's what it is. It's an expression of life itself. It's like food, I don't like eating one type. I like to have it all. <laughs> so it makes sense to me to, to, to just have it and you know, whatever gets you going and makes you want to write a song, just do it. Great, and every now and then you get one, the magic ones, and when they come out, completely bosh. There's one song we did recently, Dressed to Impress, and all apart from one line, it just, the whole song just popped out. Because sometimes you sort of, you know, you take it apart and it takes ages, but then every now and then a little song comes up and just pops out, and they're great. I love those ones. <laughs> to play. Thanks. Any more questions? Going. 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 Oh! <laughs> Not gone. No, Russell. Hey, Alice. Hello. Thanks for being Good here. Good name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. 
<laughs> hey, um, so th have you had um, any formal training at, at all? When vocally? I, um, when I was younger, I had a go, and she was getting me to do arias. But I think my main training came from the church, singing in the choir, really. Um, and just always doing it, really. And, and how old were you when you started singing in the choir? I was like four. Four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, little, little girl. There's a picture of me with a cassock. That's, That's where it funny. all comes from. And, you, and so you, you sung in the church for how many years? For Till I was about nine. I think it was like, yeah, five, five years, I think. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I know many people that... Um, our musicians or singers that come from the church, they learn so much about harmonies and just getting a song with emotion and stuff like mm. it's really lifting. You know, I think um, that's really important p from people that haven't come, br uh, haven't been brought up in church. Yeah, they, uh, they don't really experience that, but I can I can feel it in your in your you know in your music. It's really it's a great nice. training. Yeah, um, really nice. Just the harmony side of things. And I was lucky, my dad used to conduct a choir, so I'd be playing with my Lego and just overhearing like Handel's Messiah and, you know, Requiems. And so yeah. I was always hearing and going to sleep, listening to him playing Bach and stuff. So music was just in there from day one, which yeah. I'm so thankful to my parents for. Because whatever music is in your life, it doesn't matter where, what style. Yeah. If it's in there, it's in there. And it's just, yeah. Yeah, really absolutely. Uh, similar to D'Angelo, he grew up in the church as well, oh, and him. his, you know, his <laughs> his sense of harmonies he, is is amazing. And, he you know. is that is actually on my list to play that Spanish joint. Did you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> did you record that? Yes. <laughs> oh, you motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> when I heard that, I was just, and I've got the live. Yeah, the live. Someone gave me a copy of that. Well. Oh, you shouldn't have that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't know how I got that. Um, it's just sick. It's amazing. And that's, we should play that, yeah. actually. Spanish joint. Should we play that now? If you like, yeah. I think we need to play that. Let me find it. We're all going to look at you now. In awe. Cheers. <laughs> I'll ask you a question now. <laughs> just because all his harmonies in the horn part, they're almost like... The way he does the rhythms of them are so similar. Mm. Like the yeah. horn parts are almost like other vocal parts, and then the vocal parts are like that. Yeah. How did he? Do, did he just do that as he goes along, or is it all? He, he does it as he goes along. I, actually, that that song, um, he kind of wrote it really fast, and it was just kind of he forgot about it. And um, we were in the studio with uh, Charlie Hunter, um, and um, he came up, uh, and D came up to me and said, "Hey." Um, is there anything else that we, we should do? Because Charlie was about to leave. <laughs> and uh, he had played me that song on the, just the piano. And I was like, wow, that's brilliant. And that I said, like? what about the Spanish joint? And uh, that's why it's called the Spanish joint, because that was our working title for it. <laughs> so um, yeah, so he said, yeah, that's perfect. And that, that was actually the first take. So that's like a, a full live take. It makes sense, yeah. because the energy yeah. in it that's what it just propels it's you on the, each yeah, time exactly. the vocals come in it's like, exactly ah, ah, and then we got roy to do the horns and he just um just killed it he did, just, roy just has this super sensibility about harmonies and where they should go and where they shouldn't go and stuff so yeah fantastic yeah it just shows it's like a little organic living thing isn't it it's exactly just, exactly perfect. but i really love your voice it's amazing it's, oh, you're really you. really awesome yeah I'm going to lock you in a room now with a valve mic and make you record everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to that later on. Yes, oh, yeah, thanks for that. should be fun. Mm, I'm uh, glad I'm staying tonight because I was meant to go home tonight. But Yeah, we've, we've got a few vocalists in the room and I'm sure everyone in the room um, is going to be interested in watching us record some vocals and watching Russ record you. So if we can do that, that would yeah. be a good idea. Awesome. And thanks for that little... It'll be cool, eh? Thanks for that. It's definitely worse Thank things you. I can think of on a Monday afternoon than sitting listening to a Spanish joint. Mm. So um, thank you very much for joining us, Alice Russell. Yes. Thank you for Thank having you. me. Hope it was interesting or something. <laughs>